Good evening, everyone. My name is Zachary Zimmerman. I'm the president of the Federalist Society chapter here on campus. To introduce our speaker this evening, I could limit it to just three facts. He is friends with the King of England. His driver while in Russia was Vladimir Putin, and he was fired by President Biden this year. I know this sounds like the beginning of a joke, but I assure you it's not. Rodney Mims Cook Jr. is the founder and president of the National Monuments Foundation, a nonprofit charity whose mission is to create beautiful, self-sustaining destination landmarks of national and historic relevance, containing peace education centers for cultural, civic, and social activism for communities around the world. The NMF designed and co-created the Rodney Cook Senior Peace Park in Atlanta, which is dedicated to the promotion of peace and cooperation through leadership, international collaborations, and action to help solve the greatest challenges of our time, including the upcoming April 2023 World Peace Revival. Mr. Cook co-founded the Millennium Candler Peace, Justice, and Millennium Gate Prizes and established their Denmark Commission. Mr. Cook is the former Vice Chairman of the United States Commission of Fine Arts, and he designed and built the Millennium Gate Museum of Georgia History, which opened in Atlantic Station in 2008. Mr. Cook is a Washington and Lee alumnus and a scholar of the American Academy in Rome. His family, as you will hear tonight, considers this university to be home. At the age of 15, he initiated the campaign to successfully save the 5,000 plus seat Fox Theater in Atlanta and was awarded the National Preservation Prize by the National Trust for Historic Preservation for saving it. When I lived there this past summer, I know that Fox Theater, located in Midtown Atlanta, is consistently alight and highly frequented no matter what day of the week. He is a founding trustee of the Prince of Wales's Foundation for Architecture and organized the design and construction of the 1996 Prince's Olympic Games Monument in Atlanta with Anton Glykine and others. Mr. Cook's design proposal with co-designer Michael Frank won a 2011 prize for the National Civic Art Society Dwight D. Eisenhower Memorial, also for Washington, D.C. Mr. Cook was a keynote speaker at the Master Plan for 21st Century Havana Conference in 2015, which for the first time allowed Cuban citizens and international scholars and urbanists to collaborate to develop a comp comprehensive holistic vision for the entire city. Mr. Cook was a keynote speaker showcasing his virtual reality technology at the Museum of the 21st Century and New Media Technologies, Limits of Freedom Conference at the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. He gave a keynote address at Burning Man 2019 on CNU cities and the future of global urbanism on land and sea. And he was a keynote speaker representing Sunskill University at the 2021 Korea Global Forum for Peace in Seoul. I could go on about the awards bestowed upon Mr. Cook and the range of his achievements and the persons of note that call him a friend. But for our sake this evening, I noticed that through all of his work, one can trace a clear line of promoting peace and prosperity globally. And that is why he's here, in this historic landmark in which we now sit. And on behalf of WNL Students for Historical Preservation, WNL College Republicans, the WNL Chapter of the Federalist Society, and the General's Redoubt, it is my honor to welcome Rodney Mims Cook Jr. back to this university for a presentation on the legacies of our institution's namesakes and Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. But before Mr. Cook speaks, we have a representative of the King family, Dr. Alveda King, who will provide some opening remarks. Thank you all. Greetings. I'm Dr. Alveda King. It's an honor to address you tonight at University Chapel and introduce my friend, Rodney Mims Cook, Jr. Our families now have four generations of friendship. Rodney's Georgia History Millennium Gate Museum houses our King Family Legacy Library. He and I have worked together around the world on peace initiatives. He also accompanied my cousin Bernice King, who spoke at Washington and Lee five years ago on the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination. Tonight, Rodney returns to share memories and the values of lasting legacies of hope 
and reconciliation. His father, the Honorable Rodney Mims Cook Sr., was a good friend of my grandfather, Reverend Martin Luther King Sr., and subsequently my uncle, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Along with my father, Reverend A.D. King, they worked together during the Civil Rights Movement to keep Atlanta and Georgia peaceful. It was very hard work, and they were successful, despite the KKK burning a cross on the Cook's yard for their courageous efforts. Rodney brings an insightful message of peace and reconciliation to share with you tonight. His father studies in the very room you are in tonight is where he had an epiphany to seek peace and help my family and their work during that turbulent period of American history. Now we are in another turbulent period in the history of our republic and I am hopeful my words and Rodney's will help bring your community and our American community back together again. Thank you everyone and God bless you. Y'all are all welcome, certainly, to do whatever you want to and speak your mind. This talk is all about love, and I'm sorry that we can't share that together with you. I hope to teach many of you tonight some things I have learned. This talk rambles across our American landscape in extraordinary ways. It may initially confuse you, but uh, Julia's particularly here, but it all links, and the link is Robert E. Lee. You may reject it. But I hope you listen with an open mind, because I stand here this evening in a world more fractured and divided than I have seen in my lifetime. I work at the National Monuments Foundation. We are historians, and having lived in Russia, feel very strongly that the world is flying as fast as it can into World War I, yet again, the most avoidable war in human history. We should look to the great leaders in history as examples of the way to bring our nation and the world back together. Two of those leaders are the name bearers, bearers of this university, alongside a great peacemaker from Georgia, my home state, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. The National Monuments Foundation also believes that symbols are extremely important and has recently completed a peace park that celebrates 300 years of Georgia peacemakers. The lessons we can learn from the three previously mentioned men can be implemented here in Lexington and the rest of the world. But in order to do so, we must tell their stories. We must always add to the records of our American history and to our monuments. Never subtract. This is where we were. This is where we are. History is messy. Any culture that erases their history as if it didn't happen is on a very slippery slope to the ash heap of history. Republics are fragile, and my generation is now turning our republic over to your generation. And so tonight I have a story to tell you about how my father, a WNL graduate and a World War II veteran, was brought to Martin Luther King Jr. and became his ally in the Civil Rights Movement when it mattered most because of his studies of Robert E. Lee while alone in this very chapel. Five years ago, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was approaching and I asked my friend Bernice King, CEO of the King Center and daughter of Dr. King and his wife Coretta, what she was planning. I'll go back to that. The event was to be a beautiful tribute, including ringing 39 bells, Dr. King's age, at the moment the shots rang out in Memphis, April 4, 1968. Bernice was to start the bell ringing at the King tomb, and that would prompt other bell ringing tributes around the world. She requested that we participate. Our headquarters is the Millennium Gate Georgia History Museum. 
based in Midtown Atlanta, about a mile from the King Center. It is 100 feet tall, is based on the Arch of Titus, and is dedicated to the American people and the teachings of peace by Jesus Christ. Bernice's bells started gonging, which we could hear, so we started ours, and soon all our churches were joining in. This grand gesture of hers was both beautiful and tragic. The Millennium Gate was opened by our friend Congressman John Lewis on the 4th of July, 2008. Rodney, this is a place of peace. This is a place of beauty. If Dr. King could speak to us today, he would say, we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or we'll perish as fools. So when you think something that is not going right, when you think something that is out of place, out of sync, come here, come to Atlanta Station and meditate and think hard and get your soul and mind right. Thank you for this day, Rodney. The Millennium Gate was opened by John to great fanfare uh, and I'll get into a little bit more with our friendship with John later. Bernice was to begin a series of speeches that week, starting in Boston at Harvard and coming down the coast, ending here at Lexington at Washington Lee, Virginia's second and the nation's ninth oldest university. She was nervous about coming here, as Dr. King was not allowed to speak at w in the 1960s. She was even more nervous, as not only is Lee entombed in this mausoleum, under the chapel, but General Stonewall Jackson is also buried nearby. She knew both my father and I went to college here, so I offered to go with her and help in whatever way I could to make the trip the success I thought it had to be. She was appreciative, and so I made arrangements to join her and teach her about Washington and Lee. I told her that Robert E. Lee was offered to run both a railroad and an insurance company after the Civil War, which he declined in order to assume the presidency of Washington College. His fame immediately drew students and national attention to Washington College. Unlike most college presidents of his day, he did not teach, but was an ad active administrator. Attuned to new ideas, he advanced modern professional studies, along with the traditional classical curricula. After only two months in office, he petitioned the Virginia General Assembly for funds support professorships in chemical, mechanical, and civil engineering, physics, modern languages, history, and literature. He established an honor system that is still firmly in place, which has guided me most of my life. That of my father, WNL 48, and generations of other family members who have studied here. By 1869, even as his health declined, he was planning schools of commerce, agriculture, and medicine. The same year, he incorporated the Lexington School of Law into Washington College and established the first school of journalism in the nation. He is referred to as a father of modern American university curricula. The school thrived under his and President Washington's watch. And as Lee had hoped, has produced captains of industry, philanthropists, senators, poets, governors, authors, Supreme Court justices, astronauts, Tom Wolfe, and one of Elizabeth Taylor's husbands. <laughs> How many of you know who Elizabeth Taylor was? Well, I figured, okay. Uh, and how many are lawyers in here, in the law school, I should say? Numbers of lawyers. Okay, um, well, just an FYI. Uh, you can see here on the left, uh, R.E.R. R. Huntley, President Huntley, uh, giving him a diploma, but also walking Elizabeth and Senator Warner through campus. And um, great man. I had a great deal of respect for him. And then you see Justice Powell to the right. How many of you leave money at Justice Powell's bust? Show of hands? Okay. Uh, look at the plaque. Uh, it is a gift to you from my father. Uh, he and Justice Powell were pals, and he wanted to make sure that he was commemorated here. I also told Bernice, well, let me go back one, just to make sure you all know this, because I was looking for his portrait. David Lowe, he's a man of class, on the far left, 
We made fun of him when he, we were at Natural Bridge at freshman orientation. He said he wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> we said, uh, you're at the wrong place, bud. Uh, and he, he showed us all, and I don't know how well you can see that uh, above the planet Earth. It says on the sticker on his windshield, Washington and Lee University. So I told Bernice that my dad was one of WNL's products, a product of Robert E. Lee, a reluctant warrior, very bright, genius IQ, graduating summa cum laude, valedictorian of his class, ODK, Honor Society. His time at WNL was interrupted after two years at World War II. He went to Cornell and entered the Navy as a lieutenant. He was on the USS DuPage, a battle. Cla a battle, a Bayfield class attack transport with six battle stars, the most decorated ship of its type in the Pacific theater. His ship was hit by a kamikaze plane which flew directly into the ship's bridge. He had just left. All his mates were killed, very violently. He refused to discuss this until his late 80s. Transferred to Okinawa, he was later preparing for the invasion of Japan and expected to be killed. Most of his mates did as well. President Truman's traumatic decision to use nuclear weapons changed this bloodbath scenario where millions more would have been lost. My father witnessed the signing of the Treaty of Tokyo in Tokyo Bay on the deck of the Missouri from his adjacent ship. Uh, he is actually in that picture. He returned to Washington Lee a different man. He wanted to understand better why all this had happened. The main library and most of the buildings at WNL are serviced by steam, making the library so hot, as we all know, that you can open windows in 10 degree February weather and it's still too hot. My father found it very difficult to study in the heat, despite being a Georgia boy, as the heat of the South Pacific Islands affected him very badly. And he requested of Dean Gillum to study elsewhere. Uh, Dean Gillum loved my father. Uh, like a son. And so he said, you go down to the chapel. It's, it's always kind of cold in there. Uh, and you have to study in there alone. You, I can't let you tell everybody you're doing this. Uh, but you're a good student, and I have some hope for you, as many of you who knew him, which I did, uh, you know that about him. So he would study here alone. My sisters and I grew up playing in his extensive boxwood gardens around his Tudor Manor house behind Wilson Field when our parents took us to Virginia Historic Site. We always made time to stop at Belfield, see the Gillums. Dean Gillum treated me as a son also. My father studied World War I and the mistakes of the Treaty of Versailles, which brought us Hitler and led to World War II. He studied the collapse of the Roman Republic Julius Caesar, Napoleon, Lenin, Mao, leaders who fought revolutions, yet assumed tyrannical powers for themselves. And then he studied the unusual and exemplary life of Washington. George Washington is truly among the greatest of men to ever live. To have crafted a nation like ours against all odds is divine inspiration. Do not let anyone convince you otherwise. A republic like ours, had never really been truly realized, and our founders knew they were creating something of such astonishing global import that they needed divine help. Most of them knew Washington was that divine help to hold it all together. His honesty, dignity, leadership, and humility were of such high order that he became the glue that brought all of the lawmakers and authors of our most precious documents to heel. Offered a crown at the end of the day, he said, we do not fight, we did not fight this fight against all odds and the greatest monarchy in the world to replace it with another. And like Cincinnatus, he resigned his post as commander of the army before Congress meeting at Annapolis and went back to his farm, his beloved Mount Vernon. We commemorate Washington as Cincinnatus on Washington Hall, and that is why he is in a toga. King George III, when told this fact, that he had resigned his post heading the army, refused to believe it, saying, if true, Washington would go down as the greatest man of our age. 
Washington belongs to WNL, folks. To us. No other institution in America can make this claim. As we know, the Articles of Confederation were weak, not having been realized, had he declined. He established an extraordinary gravitas to the assembly of American demigods who were kept in check due to their reverence for him. This is why we symbolically honor him in our capital city that also bears his name with an obelisk. It is the largest ever built at 555 feet tall. This design beginning with the pharaohs. The gigantic scale sends a magnificent message through the ages. George Washington is greater than Pharaoh. Washington is called to serve again, reluctantly really, and leaves Mount Vernon. He is then elected our first president, aware that everything he did would become precedent for centuries. So two four-year terms being the standard until President Franklin Roosevelt stayed on a little bit longer. The odds of all of this happening must be looked at from the grand sweep of recorded history as among the greatest achievements of mankind. Yet slavery was a breaking point at the Constitutional Convention. They could not work through that moral stain and sin. To create a new republic, they had to defer that to later. And it broke families, and it broke brothers, and it broke all kinds of things. But they pulled it together. It took a civil war and over 600,000 dead Americans to solve that problem. As my good friend Andrew Young says, Americans have short memories. Isn't that enough reparations? The view today overlooking President Kennedy's grave is the subject of the 1902 Macmillan plan to redesign the District of Columbia, of which I used to be the custodian with six other colleagues. Among other things the Macmillan plan did was to create this extraordinary link between the Lincoln Memorial and the Custis Lee Mansion, or Arlington House. It is intentional. It is the uh, binding of the wound between the North and the South, that being the Potomac River. Linking Lincoln to Lee and the bridge over the Potomac is the band-aid, really, the, the, that binds us back together in brilliant ur urban planning and in stone. My father taught me this in a more personal way than I learned in books. He took my sisters and me to Mount Vernon and Arlington House often, showing us the copies of the Washington family portraits that once hung at Mount Vernon. The most famous being the first painting of Colonel George Washington in a British uniform. It used to be here. A larger-than-life portrait by Charles Wilson Peale. The original hung there until George hung at Mount Vernon until George Washington Park Custis sold Mount Vernon to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, and some family items were dispersed to other family members. One of those was Mary Custis, heiress to Arlington House, a monumental Greek temple overlooking its plantation grounds and the city of Washington across the Potomac. Mary Custis meets a very handsome, dashing, humble Army lieutenant, graduate of West Point, the only man to this day to go through that institution without a single demerit. We all know the story. She becomes the wife of Robert E. Lee. Lee's life is devoted to Virginia and is a thing I have great respect for. My family came to America in 1619 at Jamestown, so I have devotion to two states. And Lee also lived in Georgia near Savannah, having command to build Fort Pulaski around the time of the War of 1812. Lee's father, Declaration of Independence signer General Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee, whose brilliant funeral eulogy of his close friend George Washington as first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen, passes his truth through the ages. Harry Lee spent his final days in Georgia, dying at Dungeness Plantation on Cumberland Island at the residence of his comrade General Nathaniel Green and his widow Catherine. And it is recorded at a little reception in Savannah, 1791, that, uh, and Martha wasn't with him, 
uh, Washington danced upwards of two hours straight with the lovely Lady Catherine without rest. Harry Lee was buried, as was custom at the time, in the sublimely beautiful Green Family Cemetery. Dungeness is the building, is the complex on the left, and uh, results of the War of 1812 are the ruins on the right. It is on a bluff surrounded by a low tabby wall, Georgia live oaks, dripping Spanish moss, and presides over a 15-mile view across our magnificent marshes of Glen County to the mainland. Harry Lee's son, Robert, visited his grave numbers of times, bringing his children as well. Cumberland is difficult to get to now, even more so then. General Henry Lee's beautiful Georgia marble inscribed tombstone indicates he is there, but he is not. We, we may have a shin bone or a, or a finger bone, but uh, when Robert E. Lee died, the Commonwealth of Virginia requested the Georgia legislature, the remains of the father, to be removed to this building in Lexington, Virginia, to reside in the Lee Mausoleum with his son. But Georgia said no. He is too important, and he is ours. And it took the Daughters of the Revolution to allow the remains to move. It took a long time. And so General Lee's tombstone downstairs indicates his remains originally in Georgia. And my father took me to all of these Lee places. As a child in Cumberland Island loomed very large to him and to me. The place so impacted me that I passed along these stories to my friend John F. Kennedy, Jr., whose father, President Kennedy, is buried on land directly below Lee's Arlington House. JFK, Jr. came to love Cumberland so much that he chose to have his wedding there in an old Freedmen chapel. And as you can see here, anytime you have a Kennedy with you, you're going to be playing football on the beach, and it's with its tackle. So we, he, he decided to marry Carolyn at uh, Friedman's uh, Chapel near the High Point Estate of the Candler family, founders of Coca-Cola. My childhood friend Asa Candler VI, also my roommate here at WNL, compelled his cousins to invite John and Carolyn to dress and get ready for their wedding at, at the Candler compound. After the wedding, he sent me this photo, one of my prizes, and he is clearly an enthusiastic Coca-Cola fan. Uh, I think he's going to have the bottle, too. I think he might eat that bottle. And you all have to note Mrs. Onassis in her bare feet over on the, on the left. President Kennedy and thousands of others are buried at Arlington as a result of an act of General Montgomery Meigs. Robert E. Lee was summoned to the White House by President Lincoln as the Civil War approached. He offered Lee command of the Union Army. Lee, having made an oath to Virginia when he was at West Point, as all cad cadets did at that time to their native states, returned to Arlington House overlooking the nation's capital from his large column porch. There was never any question of which side Lee would choose if forced to choose. It is clear beyond doubt from his letters home from his post in Texas and his conversations with friends there in January and February of 1861 that he would never participate in invasion and conquest of the South. He anticipated he would be offered field command of the new army, and he was. He had already made his decision, though, desiring to postpone his decision until the last hope of peace was gone. He wrote to his family from the Texas frontier, if the bond of the Union can only be maintained by the sword and the bayonet, instead of brotherly love and friendship, and if strife and civil war are to take the place of mutual aid in commerce, the Union's existence will lose all interest to me. After arriving home at Arlington and looking at that view of his in this image, it is said he pointed across the Potomac to the Capitol being built and declared that beautiful feature of our landscape has ceased to charm me as much as formerly. 
I fear the mischief that is brewing there. Anguished, he rejected the offer to command Union forces on the grounds that he could not draw his sword against his beloved home state of Virginia. Lee stated that his loyalty to Virginia ought to take precedence over that which is due the federal government. He further proclaimed that he had no greater duty than to his native state of Virginia. Today, most people view and identify themselves as Americans. During the 1800s, however, many identified and viewed themselves as North Carolinians, Virginians, Texans, even Tennesseans. Through the ages, we as a people have evolved and place a, great, a, a, a greater emphasis on national identity, and that war pretty much took care of that. The day after the firing at Fort Sumter, the United States Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, directed that all United States Military Academy West Point cadets must take a new oath of allegiance. Previously, each cadet had taken an oath of allegiance to his respective state. Now they were required to swear fealty to the United States paramount to any other state, county, or political entity. Lee took command of the Army of Northern Virginia, realizing that the close proximity of his farm to the District of Columbia might cause him to never return there. He was correct. And you can see Union forces here taking his property. Initial battles in this area quickly educated officers at tactics and modern advances in weaponry caused unprecedented casualties of an epic scale. General Meade's losses were staggering, and his anger at his West Point classmate, Lee, compelled him to bury his dead in the fields and pasture lands of Arlington Plantation with a pledge that should Lee win this war, he will never plant the farm again. That is how we have Arlington National Cemetery. President Kennedy's tomb, topped by an eternal flame, is below Lee's house. On axis with the house and the Lincoln Memorial, as I said earlier. Kennedy said of Lee, as a New Englander, I recognize that the South is still the land of Washington, who made our nation, of Jefferson, who shaped its direction, and of Robert E. Lee, who after gallant failure urged those who had followed him in bravery to reunite America in purpose and courage. Even Winston Churchill is quoted saying, Robert E. Lee is one of the noblest Americans who ever lived. The war continued for years. Both sides were exhausted and Lincoln was under immense pressure to end the war. Probability that he would lose re-election if he did not. This event set in motion the campaign of William Sherman and his 60 mile wide scorched earth policy from Atlanta to the sea. Both sides of my family were burned down during this national convulsion. Lincoln turning an army on fellow American citizens. My great-great-grandfather, Judge Azariah Mims, considered his oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, not the state of Georgia, sacrosanct, different than the West Point Oath, and opposed the rebellion, as he called it, in his diary. He, had, he hid his sons so they could not be conscripted into the Confederate Army. His mapping skills assisted Union forces whose maps were lacking. His daily entries were usually loquacious, but on November 15, 1864, his single entry said chillingly, Atlanta burned today. The fall of Atlanta was the turning point in the war and assured the re-election of Abraham Lincoln, which otherwise would not have happened. The Emancipation Proclamation established the virtuous position of the U.S. government once and for all. After Gettysburg, the war was really over. Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse was an exercise of gentlemen warriors. General Grant's regard and handling of General Lee was cordial. Lee was ruined, and he would never return to Arlington. As Abraham Lincoln said, human nature will not change. In any future great national trial, compared with the men of this, we shall have as weak and as strong, as silly and as wise, as bad and as good. Let us therefore study the incidents in this as philosophy to learn wisdom from, and none of them as wrongs to be avenged. And as Theodore Roosevelt said, once the war was over, Lee instantly undertook the task of healing and binding up the wounds of his countrymen. In the true spirit, those who feel malice toward none and charity toward all. 
in that spirit which from the throes of the Civil War brought forth the real and indissoluble union of today. It was eminently fitting that this great man, this war-torn veteran of a mighty struggle, who at its close simply and quietly undertook his duty as a plain everyday citizen bent only upon helping his people in the paths of peace and tranquility, could turn his attention toward educational work, towards bringing up in fit fashion the younger generation, the sons of those who had proved their faith by their endeavor in the heroic days. Although absolutely without means, he refused all offers of pecuniary aid and all positions of emolument, although many such at high salary were offered him, Theodore Roosevelt said. He declined the invitation to go abroad, saying that he sought only a place to earn honest bread while engaged in some useful work. The offer of the presidency of Washington College, a little institution in Lexington, Virginia. Lee accepted the presidency of Washington College, thinking it could help rebuild Virginia and the Union, and moved his family to Lexington. Along with them came their belongings from Arlington, which included the Mount Vernon portrait of Washington. I mentioned to you earlier. Lee lived several more years and so improved the college as no other president or 270-year-plus history has before or since. The recumbent statue of Lee is by Edward Valentine and, as most of you know, rests directly under President Lee's tomb in the Lee family crypt one level below. It is behind these wrought iron gates that have always been open unless an evening event in the chapel compels them to be closed. The Washington portrait, among the most important and valuable assets of this or any university, has been returned to Mount Vernon for now. The gates to the Lee Memorial statue over his tomb are now closed, and we are sorry they're closed, but uh, you still get the idea. I can't imagine, though, the anguish that this would have caused my father were he alive today, because this chapel, this humble place, honoring the exemplary lives of both George Washington and Robert E. Lee, as I mentioned earlier, directly led Rodney Cook Sr. to Dr. Martin Luther King. All of this lengthy story is to give a clear sense of how my father got to this life-changing decision. Dean Gillum allowed him after World War II to study in here with the Washington and Lee portraits right in front of him. As he studied other warriors who were in no way like the two represented in this chapel, he studied Washington's ring of his slaves after his death and Lee's ring his wife's slaves before the Civil War ended and his efforts to reunite a nation he had greatly helped to separate. Dad did not think that was enough. He read every word he could find on the character of both men, trying to judge them from his experience as a former warrior in a new nuclear age. He taught me that you just can't do that. You must try to judge humans relative to their time and what they did in their time. It is modern arrogance if you do not. If you do not, he said, you will never have heroes, you will ra rarely have excellence, honor, any virtue worth having. History is history. It is very messy. It cannot be denied. And if tried, is the beginning of the end of your civilization. Communist dictatorships have mostly fallen into the ash heap of history, and that is a key reason. My father learned a thing in this chapel. He was convinced that Lincoln won the war, but that Lee won the peace, which is why I've gone on so long about him. Most Southerners looked to his example. Many would have perpetuated guerrilla warfare if he had given the word. He did the opposite, and that compelled my father to continue Lee's legacy of rebuilding the South when he returned to Atlanta. That American race relations were the most critical crisis to resolve in his lifetime, and that Atlanta and the 175-year tradition of the Atlanta Way was the model to nurture and teach our nation. This, tra this tradition of ours being that numbers of Atlanta leaders of all races and religions for over 100 years would regularly gather at each other's homes and work to keep the city peaceful at all costs. His favorite quote of Lee's is, 
was, we must move forward towards peace and reconciliation. It should be the object of all to avoid controversy, to allay passion, give full scope to reason and every kindly feeling. By doing this and encouraging our citizens to engage in the duties of life with all their heart and mind, with a determination not to be turned aside by thoughts of the past and fears of the future, our country will not only be restored in material prosperity, will be advanced in science, in virtue, and in religion. And a similar favorite quote of dad's, of Dr. King, the beloved community is a way of transforming people and relationships and creating communities grounded in reconciliation, friendship, and human dignity. Key principles include nonviolence as powerful expressions of courage, understanding, trust, and love. Robert E. Lee built Dr. King's beloved community here. Does it still exist? My father graduates and returns to Atlanta. My grandfather, Wiley Milam, was close to Martin Luther King Sr., called Daddy King. He introduced my father to him and was compelled to attend services at Ebenezer where Daddy King preached. They became good friends. This caught the attention of visionary Mayor William Hartsfield, who also knew Atlanta alone might be the only city to change people's hearts about civil rights. He nurtured my father's political career and compelled him to help fight injustices toward American citizens. My father became a member of the House of Representatives and the Atlanta City Council simultaneously for 20 years, from the early 60s to the early 80s. A law now prohibits dual offices being held. He was greatly influenced by General Eisenhower and ran as a Republican, the first elected in Georgia since Reconstruction. Daddy King was a Republican, and he advised that as well. Daddy King is seen up at the top picture, front and center, in the middle of his large family. Alveda, who spoke to us earlier, is just over his left shoulder as a little girl. And then Coretta and, and Dr. King, Mrs. King and Dr. King, are uh, in the upper right with their children immediately around them. President Eisenhower once received a letter that read, I heard you mention that you have the picture of four great Americans in your office, and that included in these a picture of Robert E. Lee. I do not understand how any American can include Robert E. Lee as a person to be emulated, and why the President of the United States of America should do so is certainly beyond me. President Eisenhower responded, Respecting your inquiry, calling attention to my often expressed admiration for General Robert E. Lee, I would say first that we need to understand that at the time of war between the states, the issue of secession had remained unresolved for more than 70 years. Men of probity, character, public standing, and unquestioned loyalty, both North and South, had disagreed over this issue as a matter of principle from the day our Constitution was adopted. General Lee was, in my estimation, one of the supremely gifted men produced by our nation. He believed unswervingly in the constitutional validity of his cause which until 1865 was still an arguable question in America. Through all of this many, these, his many trials, he remained selfless almost to a fault and unfailing in his belief in God. Taken altogether, he was noble as a leader and as a man and unsullied as I read the pages of our history. From deep conviction, I simply say this, a nation of men of Lee's caliber would be unconquerable in spirit and soul. Indeed, to the degree that present-day American youth will strive to emulate his rare qualities, including his devotion to this land, as revealed in his painstaking efforts to help heal the nation's wounds once the bitter, bitter struggle was over. We, in our own time of danger, in a divided world, will be strengthened and our love of freedom sustained. Such are the reasons that I proudly display the picture of this great American on the wall of my office. The office is the Oval Office. My father knew Atlanta could become what Atlanta is today with the stewardship of his great, greatest generation. He would ultimately bring the Atlanta way into the civil rights movement. Daddy King's son, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Ministry of Nonviolence began to gain followers 
and Daddy King introduced his son to my father. They also became friends. Atlanta Way meetings would occur at our Buckhead home when something was planned for Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, other places on Dr. King's list that needed for him to take a stand. My fathers and others were adamant that Atlanta remain peaceful and particularly Daddy King. My father's friend, Mayor Avon Allen, bravely testified before Congress in support of the civil rights of 1964, the only Southern mayor to do so. And then Dr. King wins the Nobel Peace Prize. The temple rabbi, Jacob Rothschild, chaired a formal ball in his honor. My father was among the hosts when Dr. and Mrs. King returned from Oslo. Blacks and whites worked together then to keep the peace, but had never partied together. This party changed all that. The Atlanta Way turns another chapter. This extraordinary sequence of events did not happen easily. These freedom fighters, white and black, were in grave danger much of the time. Resistance and reaction to social change can become violent. Atlanta had a major setback. Prosperous black citizens were moving into an all-white district called Cascade. Peyton Road is a major artery in that neighborhood. A barrier was constructed over Peyton Road with the understanding that black Atlantans would not move north of it. All major television networks set up in Atlanta to show the Atlanta way in tatters, calling it Atlanta's Berlin Wall. The timing was the same. Delivered symbolically from the state capitol rotunda, my father's handwritten speech demanded the wall be torn down and that Americans do not wall themselves off from fellow Americans is archived at the Senator Richard Russell Archives at the University of Georgia Libraries in Athens. The wall came down. All hell broke loose. Threats against my father, and this is pre-voicemail, my mom answering the phone, threatening her with what they would do to her and her husband and us, my two sisters and me, identifying our school, we would not return home. Police Chief Jenkins posted plainclothes police in our house at night, and then they drove me and my sisters to school, handing us off to our school principal. We couldn't ride the bus anymore. This went on for about a month and a half. And then it seemed to calm down. My mother and father went to the North Carolina mountains to play golf and try to relax, leaving it ho us at home with our babysitter. The KKK showed up at the house and ignited a cross. The house lights were turned off, and we were hustled up to the third floor. A rope at the back looks just like the front. A rope ladder was deployed out the rear dormer window, and I was cautioned to be very careful carrying my two-year-old sister down a rope ladder three stories high in case they climbed those stairs and started breaking the windows upstairs and in the central hall all the way up. It would have gone very quickly. I was six. My sister Laura's fright was something I had never seen. My grandmother lived on the same grounds, and my older sister could climb anything quickly. She was down that ladder in two seconds up to Mamie's house to call the police on very short fuse for us. And the sirens wailed, and the Klansmen quickly dispersed. I barely spoke for a year afterwards, but I did read. Dr. King colleague, Dr. C.T. Vivian, was sensitive to our situation, and he took an interest in me. He's one of the greatest men I've ever known. And I knew Dr. King. I was a child, though. He would lend me books from his 8,000-volume library, which dates back to the 18th century. All black authors. They weren't supposed to read, much less publish. CT died last year, and Governor Kemp, you can see here it, uh, when he's getting our Millennium Candler Peace Prize, uh, an image of him with President Obama giving him, 
President, uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest award. And so he would lend me books, and I'd read them and return them, and he'd send some more back. This went on for about a year and a half. And so uh, Governor Kemp allowed me to assist in the choreography of his Georgia Capitol Rotunda Memorial funeral. The only person other than Coretta to receive that honor. From the same rotunda in which my father had called on tearing down the Peyton Road wall decades before. And I was able to announce that CT gave his great library, all of it, to my foundation. You might be surprised that that's Congressman Lewis on the left, uh, with, and they're both young, uh, John and Julian. Uh, and Julian was later elected to the House, yet denied a seat for anti-Vietnam positions. Only a few people voted to seat him. My father was among them. The U.S. Supreme Court ultimately seated him. I'd like to say something about uh, this man. Uh, not only is he a, an excellent public servant, but he's also a veteran. So let's give him a round of applause for having gone overseas as a criminal, as a member of the greatest generation. You know, one of the most inspiring stories of public service in the annals of history is that of Cincinnatus. Cincinnatus was, was a general who had retired, but when the city was under siege and there was danger all about, the people called out for him to return to defend the city. And he defended the city, I believe, twice against foreign and domestic enemies, but then returned to his farm and was able to lay his power down. Uh, Alderman, State Representative, you are our living Cincinnatus. You are the stuff of tremendous public courage and uncommon valor. You know, you couldn't have done what you did for my father if you hadn't already been one hell of a man, full of courage, full of integrity, full of fight. You are the stuff of legend that we have to aspire to. And God bless you. We love you. And my family, my father, I spoke to him at great length over the weekend about you. And what you have done is not told often enough not explained, not repeated, but necessary and needed and required knowledge. And for that, and for, your, for the service you've given this city and will continue to give, we thank you. God bless. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and thank you for inviting me and my family back to City Hall. It's changed so much, I'm not sure I would have recognized it if I hadn't known where I was, but uh, it's brought back many memories of hard-fought battles, won and lost. My old warrior friend, Judge Richard Freeman, was always at my side, and I would like to acknowledge his widow, Christina. Where's Christina? There she is. <laughs> who is here to share this day uh, with my family and me. My mother and father, Bess Mims, and James Cook instilled in me a sense of service to my fellow man and my city. I'm hopeful that you will think that our generation has done our job and delivered to you a brave and beautiful city. My son likes building monuments and parks, and I've been on him to put a special one back in Vine City, English Avenue, a neighborhood that was always good to me. So, Memzo, uh, quit talking and get to work. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me back. Uh, it's a great honor. Thank you. Again, all of this Southern story linking my father to Martin Luther King Jr. and his disciples and my father's brave support of the Civil Rights Movement is because of Robert E. Lee, 
I wanted his daughter, Bernice King, to hear this story when she spoke at WNL five years ago on the week of the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination. And I wanted to tell it to her in this chapel. She did not know any of this story and was reluctant to come here, as I already mentioned. We decided to discuss it after her speech so she could concentrate on that with no distractions. And she was a bit nervous about it. She was magnificent. She spoke over at Linfest. Her command of oratory and astonishing voice sounds so much like her dad. She spoke standing room only, and after the speech, I helped her save, sell her latest book, sell, sold them all, and mentioned going to the chapel again. She said she would call me later that evening to determine when we would go there the next day. The next day around 10.30, I had not heard from her and I needed to get to, to Roanoke. It felt wrong. If I pushed her more, it was uncomfortable. If she went reluctantly and it was a bad experience, it would be disappointing for both of us. About 30 minutes down the road, she called me asking when we could go to the Lee Chapel. I told her I had not heard from her and thought she was, I was putting too much pressure on her and I was down the road too far to turn back. I had to get a plane. And so she said she'd call me back in 10 minutes. I was puzzled. And 10 minutes later, she called saying she's at the chapel and she can't get in. The doors are locked. I said, well, that was the day that it was closed and I had arranged to have it open for us, uh, but I didn't think she wanted to go. And so I had canceled it. And so she said she was here anyway. And what in the world was so important to get me, for me, to get her inside this building? And so uh, I told her the story that I've just told you. And here she, here's Bernice here at uh, the dedication of uh, the park that Dad compelled me to. We finished it. it took 10 years. But, um, and then you can see Ambassador Young's statue. We were just unveiling that recently in the upper left. And then you can see Andy uh, on the far right uh, as Bernice is praying and dedicating the park at the podium. So I told her the whole story, this lengthy story that I've told you guys tonight. You've been very patient. An important story. And that my father was brought to her father and helped him because of Robert E. Lee. And that Lee Chapel was why. And I could tell that she was audibly moved by our multi-generational family relationship. Made, very, made manifest by this very southern place we look at from completely different perspectives. The moment was among the more significant of my life. She said she and her colleague, Delise, also a friend of mine and a preacher, she, they were touching the doors and that a prayer was in order. And she deferred to Delise to deliver the prayer because she was too upset. And so on the lawn of Washington Lee University, populated by st students throwing frisbee, studying on their computers under trees, faculty strolling up and down the colonnade, all under the gaze of our monumental statue of George Washington in Cincinnati, atop the central building's cupola, Elise and Bernice eulogized two old warrior Southern friends, black and white, who both wanted to change America for the better and did so. The prayer was sweeping and beautiful. There is a great deal of Georgia connection to WNL and is a step to peace and reconciliation to a broad contingent of, of alumni. I propose that there could be a linkage to the university's highly successful and nationally acclaimed Shepherd Poverty Program, where understanding the causes, consequences, and most promising remedies of poverty requires direct collaboration with common. I'm sorry, community partners. Under it, we would target WNL alumni around the country where this help is needed. They would serve as a nucleus of volunteers, students, and full-time staff members who would get community leaders on board, investigate and document the problems to be addressed, design specific actions to be taken to address the problems, form and implement plans to carry out these actions, and record and report the results on a continuing basis to WNL. And I have another idea. Uh, the city of Atlanta has renamed the 19th century newly rebuilt Mims Park, which my ancestor Livingston Mims built, to Rodney Cook Senior Peace Park. 
the picture I just showed you. It is the first integrated park in the city's history in the 1890s, over 65 years before the Civil Rights Act. A school was allowed in the park which overtook it during the 20th century, and the park originally celebrated 200 years of Georgia peacemakers. A century later, it now celebrates 300 years of Georgia peacemakers, and if Georgia were a nation, she would be number five in Nobel Peace Laureates. On his deathbed, my father compelled me to put this park back, and it opened in July of 21. This park, which Dr. King's life home faces, and which we have managed to get the National Park Service to purchase, and they are restoring it now, and will open it to the public. It is in an underserved neighborhood called Vine City, whose residents expected to be gentrified out upon the completion of the rebuilt park. But their pride of the National Monuments Foundation recording in bronze and stone their peace heroes who changed the world compelled them to embrace us. And they trusted my father. They came to trust me. As a result of years of working together, the NMF family became so close to our friends there that alternate ideas were the result. One important one being that we compelled the Atlanta mayor to freeze all of the residents' property taxes allowing them to remain in the neighborhood as long as they wished, or sell them, and they would become millionaires. No one has sold yet, and their houses are approaching that number now. Many of our alumni at this university are unhappy with its direction, so possibly a joint shepherd poverty program in Vine City would be that alumni peace gesture to bring us all back together. The NMF is installing a 10-foot bronze of Dr. King on the central plaza of Rodney Cook Senior Peace Park in April, the 55th anniversary of his assassination. This statue here is the full-scale maquette of the King statue we will unveil in April. You are the first to see it. A billion prayer peace revival is now underway, which complements our peace walk and King statue unveiling on April 1st. Could we collaborate with you to celebrate this with us? Could we bring this back? What can we do to join together again? This is the Atlanta way. This is what our region can teach, unlike any other, as to how we can heal our nation. Talk to each other and actually listen and hear one another and work together again. I end with my favorite Dr. King quote, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. The story I have told you tonight could only be told at this August University and only here in this chapel. Not Harvard, not Princeton, not William and Mary, Yale, Stanford, none of them. This story belongs to all of you. My generation is turning this republic over to yours. What will you do with her? It is yours to choose. Having lived in Russia, I hope together our time tonight is a wake-up call to the young people in this room. Republics are fragile. Jefferson gave us 200 years. We are way beyond that. Washington and Lee is older than this nation. And the people of this reunified nation, north and south, looked to one place, one man, who won the peace to bring us back together in peace. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. We discussed two of them tonight. Washington and Lee can and must rise to the occasion to stop this national division and set the example as we alone from Lexington, Virginia have achieved over 160 years ago. Unify and heal this nation. Have it go out from here. Thank you very much.
not a question, I'm sorry. It's just a statement that I'm glad of the folks that are here, but there are many that should have been here and are not. So I'm sorry about that. But I'm glad about your speech. I hope we can find a way, Tom, to make a copy of that, circulate that. Yeah, and, and, and uh, circulate it as possible, as much as possible within the community. I'm going to let you take over. Question? That's good. Uh, thanks again for coming to speak tonight. Um, I was uh, wondering what you made of the demonstration that took place before uh, the event tonight, um, and, and what you might make of the fact that there are no faculty here. Um, why that might be the case. A little bit louder. What did I think of what happened out there? Yes, okay. and in here. I started, I went out and watched, and uh, you know, there was, anyway, I don't need to go into what threats there were, but um, uh, I, I started to ask if I could speak to them. Um, but then when it, and I thought that might be considered rude. They don't know me. I don't know that they read anything that this talk was about. Um, and, you know, it might have gone on too long for them. They might have been too bored anyway. But um, they didn't expect this. Gotcha. And we didn't announce that Alveda was going to welcome everybody, Alveda King. Um, having heard those two, or seen one thing here, and that beautiful introduction, um, they hesitated to leave. I don't know if you noticed that. They were supposed to be disruptive based on what our friends here had told me at the law school. Uh, so maybe they were moved for a moment and their leaders stood and so they followed him. Um, I think it's uh, a shame. And maybe if you guys can talk about it a little bit more, maybe they'll watch the video. We'd love to have them come down to Atlanta April 1st to our Billion Prayer Revival when we unveil the bronze of this great man. Uh, they'll meet a lot of very interesting people that they actually do admire. Did I answer your question? Uh, I, su I suppose that'll happen. You can ask it again if I didn't. I, 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 maybe we could talk about it privately. Okay. Any other questions? Is there? Yeah. Hi, Mr. Cook. Thank you for being here once again. Um, I'm actually an alum of the undergraduate side, and I'm a current law student as well. Um, obviously, I'm in black tonight supporting some of my fellow colleagues, um, and I decided to stay and listen, and I do appreciate you being here tonight, and I hope that we can have this discourse. Part of the situation here is that we go to Washington and Lee, a school that I absolutely love, I'm sure many of you love. However, we are constantly reminded of Robert E. Lee every day, and that's not necessarily an issue except the fact that he did defend an institution that wanted to keep slavery. And so for fellow African-American students here, it's hard to grapple with that history while you know, loving this institution and the community that we have here. And we are constantly reminded of Robert E. Lee. We are not erasing history here. He's, he's actually, he's right behind you. And his name is on, it's called Washington and Lee. His horse is everywhere. He's on buses. It's, I, it's, I put him behind me. He was not, the gates were not allowed to be open tonight. You're right. Yes, sir. However, my, my question for you, I suppose, is in the way that we still have Robert E. Lee around us, and although he actually did not form the honor system that was debunked in a commission in 2018 that the university sponsored, how are we losing history in your words? And, and why do you feel that he is so important to maintain when he has this complicated history? Well, first, are you uh, 
And, and I might, you're kind of a, a local historian, and I might call on you to help me with some of this. Yeah, but um, as far as uh, President Lee uh, supporting an institution that uh, uh, was all about slavery, are you convinced that you have read such uh, historical fact that you can make a statement like that? You've made it. I am not convinced of that fact, and I've read a lot about him. He, he was defending he was a, the state of Virginia. He, he, was in, he was defending his native state that he had taken an oath to protect and defend, and he did not want to go to war. He freed, he did, he did not own slaves. His wife did. He freed them before the war was over. He thought it was a horrible institution, and he knew he would be ruined, which he was, if he took that position. And so I disagree with your point of view, uh, much less he, he was offered a, a great manor house in England to go over there and get out of here. Most people would likely have done such a thing. And he came here. He came to this place. Not the New York Life Insurance Company on Park Avenue or not the Vanderbilt Railroad or any of these other places. He came here to us. If you don't agree with him, why come? Are you a student here? I'm a current. I'm actually going to be a double general. Okay. Well, I, I love don't understand Washington. why people would come to an institution like this unless they have really studied these people and know what they really did and really believe. And these days, we don't, we don't study this anymore. History has gone out the window. I cannot tell you how many young people in Atlanta, majority black city, these, we have these kids come through our Georgia History Museum all the time. They have no idea what Dr. King taught. They know who he was. He's famous. They don't know what he taught. We have got to fix this. And education is the big failure. And so, uh, Neely, if you could help her with that, because I don't know the answer to your other question. Yeah, I want to take a little different tack. I'm an historian. I have a PhD, and I've written extensively on Lee. And I wrote a long piece. Uh, on Lee and the honor system. And um, uh, Lee did not start the honor system. But what's happened is, is that propaganda, in many cases, has replaced history. And so what I wanted to find out is, what was Lee's contribution to the honor system? And I found that there were two things, which are the most important things about the honor system. The honor system, which existed here prior to the war, was not run by the students. It was run by the faculty. And it was very uh, erratic in its uh, application, and it didn't apply equally to everyone. And under Lee, two things happened. The first is that Lee allowed the students to run the honor system. Now, what's the most important thing about the honor system at Washington Lee is the fact that the students run it. Robert E. Lee did that. And the second thing that Lee did was that under him, the single sanction was developed. Now, that was developed by the students, too, not by the faculty. And those are the two hallmarks of the honor system. So no, Lee didn't start it. But when you hear a report, well, Robert E. Lee didn't start the honor system. That's true in a very limited and very minimally historical way. Okay? In that, he started the two most important aspects of the honor system. All right? And there wouldn't be an honor system without Lee, because Lee, the whole approach to the students was to allow them the freedom to develop institutions, to develop civility, to develop the many things that we think about here. So Robert E. Lee is the most important person in the history of the honor system. He didn't start it, but he's the most important person in the history and development. That's my view. But if you, if you read everything and you come to a different conclusion, that's fine. But what's happening is, instead, people are being told, well, Robert E. Lee didn't start the honor system, as if he had nothing to do with it, as if he wasn't important in the development of the honor system. That's simply not true. Thank you. I appreciate your answers. However, I would like to say that rather than making assumptions about what the students here know, it might be better to even go out and talk to them personally and understand whether or not they did do their research. I, I, I would have loved to have had that conversation with them. Are, are they still outside? I have no idea. I can't speak for those students. However, I can say that please don't make assumptions about the current student body or that we're extremely divided. I'm a student here. I came back for a reason. 
I was a graduate of 2020. I was here during the 2016 election, and I'm still here. However, I have also felt that the memory of Robert, and, Robert E. Lee is divisive, no matter, you can't get around that. So all I'm trying to say is, please don't make assumptions about you what can, research, you can excuse get around me, it. one second. If you teach the truth, you can get around it, because it's divided people too much. And there has to be some sort of way that we can come back together and not just say that this person who brought the peace back to our country uh, is, is marginalized now. We, we, the woke culture, we cannot just continue doing this. We have to start speaking to each other again and figure it out and not just to miss, dismiss great people uh, because we are judging them by our modern standards and yet we're not even studying him thoroughly enough to answer the questions that you asked me. Um, I think you made assumptions about him. They're not true. Mr. Cook, I'm, I'm done. I understand. Absolutely. And, and during the speech tonight, it was said that Robert E. Lee did start the honor system, and that was incorrect. So I was just correcting that. Sir, I'm a law student. I don't have a PhD in that. And I never doubted that for a second. I was merely saying that he did not start it because, excuse me, I have not interrupted you this whole time. I'm actually about to be done speaking. However, I listened to the history lesson for the past hour and a half, and I did not interrupt. However, I have been interrupted multiple times. So, I, I want to... He did, and hopefully oh, there's a record to support that. But I really do appreciate you being here this evening. We're here to start a discourse, and I'm trying to promote that. We do appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Sure. Yes. We have about 10 minutes left for a question to answer, just FY. Do you mind? No, I don't mind. Um, I'm Cheryl Nestor. The young lady that just spoke. Yeah, loudly. Can you please. not hear me? Okay. Uh, the young lady that just spoke, a lot of times it's helpful if we hear from firsthand accounts. And uh, Zach, President Zachary Taylor's son, Richard, I read a first-hand account of what it was like to serve in the Confederate Army with Lee and Stonewall Jackson. And if you read these accounts, you hear that the topic was not slavery. They were not fighting to continue slavery. They were fighting to prevent the loss of the right to, succeed, to secede from a, from a federation that they had decided to join. In his first-hand account, you rarely hear the topic of we are, you don't hear the topic of we're fighting to preserve slavery. They were fighting for Virginia and Virginia's right to exist as a sovereign state, not as a you know, part of a, a, a federal state. So that kind of first-hand account will enlighten the understanding of what they were doing versus what the interpretation today is of what they were doing. Um, and he has a wonderful first-hand account in that, uh, in that book. And I wish I could remember the name of the book. Uh, but it's written by Richard Taylor, uh, President Zachary. Uh, one, okay. Hi, uh, Jake McCabe. I'm a current senior here at WNL. And... Um, Thank you for, for the talk. That was awesome. It's really insightful. And uh, one thing that I heard you mention that I really agreed with was that education in, in this country is really lacking. Um, I came from a public school in Houston, uh, which is a very similar city to Atlanta, very similar makeup and culture. Um, and kind of on a different note from what we've been talking to, I was curious about how the National Monument Foundation is kind of supporting public education and kind of trying to get students uh, to see the whole picture and kind of realize history in a, in a full context. We have, uh, we, Georgia history is compulsory uh, for uh, eighth graders. And we have a million children come through our building every year. And we have programs repeatedly, we have speaker series. 
Uh, we have a Peace Institute. We bring them in for some of those. Also, we've had some impact in some interesting areas. President Carter has helped us. Carter Center is involved with us. Uh, and so um, we are a, we, I, I regard myself as an educator. And, um, and, and my office is now closed because the kids like it too much. Uh, and Julius, you know that, you've been up there. Uh, it's a desirable space and um, it's, I can't work in there. And it's on the top and so it's for them and it's always been open. But uh, now you can't work in there with a lot of uh, eighth graders. And so um, uh, we are very dedicated to that pursuit. We are now doing a K through 20 Georgia education program that is very focused on the uh, peace efforts to, uh, and, and we've got uh, the Georgia Regents involved, which govern all of our state universities. And in our Peace Park, we would have programs there that would be a master's and PhD and postgraduate studies that would be uh, essentially a degree in peace studies. Because we were just reactionary for millions of years, human beings. We just, we're just making the same mistakes over and over and over and over, and we don't study. And um, so we're trying to create a curricula that is unique to the nation, not the world. Um, NSEAD, the Business School of Europe, has been, they did the white paper for us. Um, Olivier Gestart Stang was our sponsor there. Um, and we have eight different institutes from around the world who want to open their offices in our Peace Institute. So that will be a new program coming out, higher education. Uh, but we started with eighth grade. One more. Sure. I'm a citizen of Lexington, a homeowner, and an old 66 grad of WNL. <clears throat> I'm also an engineer, and I have a photographic memory, so I almost remember everything when I was old enough to start remembering. There's some things I don't understand. All of this cultural change and denial of history uh, is obsolete and old-fashioned, and yet is still being promoted. In this little village, people have yard signs, and the only yard signs I've ever seen before when, when someone wanted to sell their home. So everybody divides up into talking points. I was think I'm think uh, it's working okay. <clears throat> I'm thinking if Lincoln hadn't been shot, he would have let the South down easy, as he said he was going to do. I couldn't think of anything better than to see Lee and Grant and Lincoln at the White House in 1865 and beyond. We wouldn't have had all of that. Here it is, the 21st century, and we're in, we're, there is an international war going on in Europe. Isn't that old-fashioned? My goodness. Do you think there will be any medicine, like we finally got some, to prevent or to cure COVID? to get out of this duel between personalities and people? You said it was love, not hate. Do you think we'll ever get out of this cultural, ignorant of history and try to destroy the history that we've created in this republic? Thank you. Yes, I do. Uh, I wouldn't have spent all the time I have just to prepare this and come up here uh, to talk to you. Uh, I feel very... Imp I have a great love. And, and the message that came from here, which the nice lady out there who asked me that question a minute ago, she just doesn't know, she hadn't studied that. We can do it again. That's why I'm so glad y'all are here. Just talk up this talk. Invite us back.
You're the first to see this great statue of this great man. I'll tell you something really interesting. Um, and I, my mother is 96, poor woman. All those bomb threats and cross burnings, it, it broke my parents' marriage. She was terrified. Terrified. Dad wouldn't stop. And he said, honey, someone has to do this job, or we're going to have race riots for the rest of the history of this country. It's going to be a bloodbath. We have to fix it. Interestingly, they really did fix it. But something happened. Something changed. And Ambassador Young, my dear friend, has said, we are losing all of the major advances that my generation made. We were almost post-racial, and something happened. We have to fix that. We have got to figure out, come together, and fix it. And the only way to do it is education and getting together and things like this. You, you look like you're dying to speak. I know we're out of time, so quickly, just yell it out. I ran the uh, university store for 10 years, from 203 to 213. And in that day, we had a whole wall on Robert E. Lee, the Civil War, Grant, Lincoln. Had another whole wall on George Washington and the Revolution. Today, that's all been removed. There's a small little section on George Washington, small section on Robert E. Lee. It's totally happening at your university. The good news, there's 2,000 students on this campus, and I stay in contact with most of them. And you saw about two or 300 today, but there's about 15 or 1,600 students that have the value that we all have who don't want this, but they're not getting the opportunity to even learn about it. They do not want us to even study it. This is a school of higher education, and you cannot get the information. It, it's sad. We just need more people to get involved. We need to get the parents involved, the 2,000 parents involved, to understand what's happening to this university. It, it's a lot of hope, but I'm telling you, they're not. You just saw 200 people, 100 people walked in here that do not want to learn. They don't like new information. What you told us tonight, some stories I've not heard before. It's just sad. We, there's a lot of hope. The hope that we have some students here. But we need to really encourage the students to get involved. But the other students what, what are not. What uh, if Washington Lee or PR or whomever it might be invite all of those students to come to Atlanta and, and see faculty, what we've done? We have 300 faculty, 300 faculty and 300 staff. That's 600 people. Zero were here tonight. Zero. 300 faculty. Open-minded group of people teaching our young people. It's just, it's just overwhelming. I'm, se I'm 78, and I pray for this country to get the young people involved, get the parents involved. We need to get off the side sideline. We have a lot of educated people helping us. We need to get more people involved in what we're trying to do. Tell your friends I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.